All right, the Good Samaritan, one of the most popular parables. And the title of it kind of indicates, implies what Jews felt about Samaritans because here was a good Samaritan. Right? Remember who the Samaritans were. The, the Jews and the Samaritans looked upon each other with contempt. And so this isn't merely just a Michigan, Ohio State sort of contempt. This is much deeper than that, right? Uh, there was an expression that a Jew would rather drink pig's blood than to associate with a Samaritan. And we all know how Jews feel about pork, right? And so where did this animosity come from? Well, in the 8th century BC, the Assyrian Empire had come and invaded the northern part of Israel, and they exiled the northern tribes and mixed with those, who's, those Israelites who set up their own rival temple on Mount Gerizim. And that's how the Jews felt about it, right? Right there. So, to, and they would offer sacrifice because they had mixed with some of the Israelites. And so they would offer sacrifice to the God of Israel, but the Samaritans would do it outside of the covenant. Right? So they, they did it outside of this authority that, that God had established in his chosen people. So it ruined the unity of God's chosen people. So they were the cause for the, the ten tri northern tribes then of Israel being dispersed. So that's the background context of Jesus telling this parable to a scholar of the law who was asking, who was testing Jesus actually, because he already knew the answers to his own questions. But because this Jesus was, the, you know, this expert of the Torah, the first five books of the, the Bible, he was testing Jesus who was getting all kinds of followers and he wanted to test to see if this Jesus was, a, was legit. And so this scholar tests him with this question of what must be done to inherit eternal life. And Jesus, as he sometimes does, responds back with another question. Well, what is written in the law? And the scholar responds, of course, with the Shema, the great, greatest commandment, and its corollary of loving your neighbor as yourself. So he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your being, with all your strength and with all your mind, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus confirms that the scholar uh, has answered correctly because those two commandments sum up the entire law, right? I mean, the Ten Commandments in itself is a summary of the law. The, the first three deal with the love of God, and the seven other seven commandments deal with the love of neighbor. But this was an e even more concise summary and Jesus says, do this and you will live. What Jesus has yet to fully reveal is that that love of God entails believing in him because that God you are to love with all your being has become flesh and stands before you. That, that'll come in a bit, right? With the Paschal mystery. But anyway, the scholar of the law follows up his testing of Jesus with another question. He says, well, so who's my neighbor? What qualifies as my neighbor? Who am I supposed to love as myself? And the way Jesus answers that question is with this parable of the Good Samaritan. And obviously, by Jesus answering the question with this parable, your neighbor is not just the people you like. Because Jesus, it's not, it's not just your peeps, because Jesus uses this this despised Samaritans and lifts one of them up as an example of what a true neighbor is for a Jew. In other words, Jesus is backing up his teaching with another way of saying that you are to love even your enemies. And so your neighbor is not just the people you like, your peeps. You know, oh, they're my peeps. Of course I'm going to love them. But you and I are called to love not just our peeps, but also our enemies, those who wish us ill. So your neighbor is whoever God puts in your life. And that is the one who you are to love. And the one of whom uh, 
you are to will their good. As God's word tells us, do not, overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by? Yeah, by, with good. Do not, overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And Jesus backs up those words with his very life. Now, that doesn't mean Jesus was soft on evil any more than, or that doesn't mean we're soft on evil any more than Jesus was soft on evil. But he also realizes that evil has a lot of souls that he loves captive. And like, for example, if you want a perpetrator, if you want to stop a perpetrator from hurting your loved ones, for example, and thereby, and, and thereby them committing a mortal sin that endangers their soul, part of that may mean incapacitating the person from being able to commit that horrible mortal sin. Right? So nevertheless, you're desiring that the good of that person, the ultimate good of that person, that is salvation, concurrently in that duty of protecting your loved ones. But Jesus obviously gives us the ultimate example of, of loving your enemies, and that's what he did on the cross. Because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, Scripture says. We were enemies to God and his kingdom by our desire to, to go away, to say, hey, God, forget your commandments. I'm doing it my own way. We made ourselves enemies to God and his kingdom. And yet Jesus loved us and gave his life for us. And he desired our good. He desired our salvation. So who really is this good Samaritan that Jesus describes? On one level, yes, it's to be me and you. We're all called to follow, imitate, and be that good Samaritan in the parable for the people around us. But that good Samaritan ultimately that we're called to imitate is Jesus Christ himself. Right? Many of the church fathers interpreted this parable in that light. Jesus is the one who runs into the sick and helpless soul that's half dead, right? Like zombies, <laughs> spiritually, right? Morally. That's every person on the face of the earth without Christ. So he is the one who tends to our wounded souls, lifts us up, and takes us to the inn where we may be healed. He is the one who gives the innkeeper instructions to care for him until his return. Now, if the good shepherd symbolizes Jesus, what is this inn to which Jesus takes us? The church fathers also mention the symbolism behind this, right? The church is the inn to whom Jesus entrusts all souls until his return. If you remember, uh, right after the resurrection, Jesus appears on the shore of Galilee, post-resurrection, and he asks uh, Peter three times, do you love me? I.e., do you love God the Son, right? Giving him a threefold, um, to make up for his threefold denial and his passion during, during his trial. And how does G Peter responds, yes, Lord, I love you. But then what does Jesus, okay, if you love me, God the Son, if you love me, then what does he say three times? Tend my sheep, feed my flock, tend my lambs, take care of my lambs. So the very same love of God, love of neighbor, unity there. And he entrusts that mission to Peter who is the head of the vicar of Christ, right? Representing him on earth as the head. And we are the members, right? So, so that unity of head, Jesus our head, and we are the members of his body. So through you and me as the body of Christ, the local Christian community, each and every one of us living in the world but not being of it, Jackson's wounded souls are to receive the corporal and spiritual works of mercy, the nourishment of the sacraments, and the company and the friendship of the family of God until Jesus comes again. Are we fulfilling our vocation then? You know, last weekend I was uh, at a parishioner's home enjoying the incredible fireworks show that they put a lot of effort for the viewing pleasure of those present. It was a pretty extensive fireworks show. So during that, we had some just, you know, as you're watching, you get 
time to contemplate state of the country, state of whatever, our, our own selves. And I, I was thinking how different America is now than the America I grew up in in the 1980s. And part of that is that we don't spend as much person-to-person -person time with those around us, our family, our friends, our neighbors, our, our members of our community. I mean, COVID certainly put a kibosh on that the last couple of years, but it's also because we live uh, much more distracted lives. So we might even be the same number of hours present to the same people, but we're not fully present, undividedly present to those who, that God puts in our life. So many people now spend so much time interacting virtually so much online with people from all over the country. And that has its benefits, but, but what we gain in width, we lose in depth, right? Because technology has certainly brought with it many advantages, benefits, conveniences. It's enhanced our life in many ways. But I think we've also lost a lot by living so much of our life in front of a screen. We can miss the opportunities to be that good Samaritan that Jesus encouraged us to be in today's gospel. The, the, the people in need that are right in front of us, but we're, right? People desire authentic attention to be known and to be loved. And if our loved ones and our neighbors aren't getting the real thing from us, they'll settle for that virtual version that often leaves people empty because it's not the personal the intimate, the incarnate love for which we were made. That's what the Good Samaritan provided a total stranger in today's gospel. You know, many don't have anyone to pray for them and their healing, which is, that's a big reason why we have our Hope and Healing prayer team that make themselves available after each 10 a.m. Mass. And, but what that prayer team what those prayer team members do for our parishioners after 10 a.m. Mass, is that that's what we should be doing for others outside of this building, right? Listening to their struggles, lifting them up to the one who can give them healing and peace amidst those struggles, and accompanying them with our friendship, and eventually inviting them to, to the spiritual end that is the church. Are we being the Good Samaritan, then not only in attending to the wounds of the body, but are we being the Good Samaritan in the more profound way, that, that deeper poverty that Mother Teresa mentions uh, that attends to the deeper wounds of the soul of the people God has put into our lives. In order to do so, we may need to free ourselves from distractions in our life, so I thought the bishop's challenge for this, this past week, the disciples together on the way, was of praying the litany of humility each day was a very fitting prayer because it's the virtue of humility that helps us declutter our lives and make it less complicated, freeing us so that we can once again sensitize our souls to be that good Samaritan, attentive to the people around us in our daily lives, their needs and the wounds that have been inflicted, that life has inflicted upon them, right? If there isn't anyone in your life that you can, that could use your attention, perhaps, you know, create those relationships. Strike up conversations with people at work or at the club you belong. Perhaps become a Knight of Columbus or be a part of the Christian Service Committee or inquire about being a Stephen Minister or part of the hospitality team for our faith formation events or sponsor uh, someone looking into becoming Catholic. Maybe think outside of the box, right? And pray about becoming foster parents. Uh, our, our, as our Catholic Charities Organization needs more of, more of them, more foster parents for the increased number of foster children. Talk about woundedness, right? You can be that good Samaritan for, for the whole life of a child. Uh, perhaps volunteer at the two places I mentioned a couple of weekends ago after the historic overturning of Roe versus Wade, the Birthline Pregnancy and Parenting Center on Porter Street and the Center for Women on Lansing Ave, right? Centers that actually help uh, women and children. So to bring it back full circle, while the Good Samaritan is Jesus Christ, our Lord tells us to go and do the same. Go and do likewise. Because as St. Teresa of Avila said, 
Christ has no body now but yours. No hands, no feet on earth but yours. Yours are the eyes through which he looks compassion on this world. Yours are the feet with which he walks to do good. Yours are the hands through which he blesses all the world. Yours are the hands, yours are the feet, yours are the eyes. You are his body. Christ has no body now on earth but yours. So may the church, you and me, be who we are as the body of Christ in the world today.